Um, I'm so glad I talked to Rabbi Jordan Schuster at the reception earlier because I had one very key error in the biography I was going to give him. You see, I worked with the materials that Hebrew College gave me, but then, of course, I also did my own research. Um, and um, I discovered that he once had um, been a, a very high-level yoga instructor. Um, and he said, no, 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 I just managed the yoga studio. I couldn't actually do yoga. So <laughs> I'm really glad that I'm not going to get that wrong. Um, before becoming a rabbi, Jordan Schuster uh, managed a yoga studio. <laughs> he, like, he saw lots of yoga. Um, he was a graduate student in Yiddish literature, and now, having been ordained by Hebrew College, he is also the director of this rabbinical school's preparatory Mekorot program. He's also worked in the greenhouse of a local grocery store, and like Rabbi Berenbaum, he spent some formative time in the great state of Wisconsin. Please, this somehow seems very important. I don't know why. Please welcome <laughs> Rabbi Jordan Schuster. Mark, I'm a, I'm a little upset that um, I don't even get a ranking for where I fall in the impresarios from Milwaukee, but... <sighs> um, so it is my honor tonight to dedicate my story to Rabbi Sharon Cohn Anisfeld. And um, I'm specifically dedicating this story to you because it's set at this very strange, quivering, liminal moment in my life where, although it was entirely unconscious at the time, I was really wrestling to figure out whether to commit, my, commit myself to a life of the mind or a life of the spirit. And the first time I met you, I sat in one of your classes, and without saying it, you made profoundly clear to me that that distinction between mind and spirit is entirely artificial and unnecessary. Because the Torah you taught was not only intellectually brilliant and luminous, but the way you related to the class and held the students and made us all feel seen and perfectly met proved to me that you know how to deeply live the Torah. And in addition to that, you know how to let Torah live through you. So I dedicate this story to you. I'm, I'm also resisting the urge to like look at myself on the screen. <laughs> okay, so my story begins when I am a fourth year doctoral student at Columbia um, studying comparative literature. And somehow over the course of those four years, I become entirely obsessed with a very specific moment in Yiddish literature, which is in and of itself a very specific genre. But that moment I call Yiddish nihilism. And in retrospect, I think what magnetized me to Yiddish nihilism was the sheer fact that I had no idea how to respond to it. This was a literature written by a bunch of East European Jews who felt totally betrayed by the world, totally betrayed by their tradition, totally betrayed by God. And the stories they wrote were all very much about how existence is nothing more than violence and chaos and meaninglessness. 
um, I didn't know how to respond to that. And needless to say, I was not a pleasant person to be around during that <laughs> period of my life. So as I'm sort of withdrawing more and more from my friends, because I am compulsively pursuing the white whale of Yiddish nihilism, my friend David buzzes at my door, and he climbs my stairs, and uh, he says, Jordan, um, you have not returned my phone calls for over two and a half months. And I'm like, David, I know I just, I have to get these papers done. I can't get these papers done. I have all these papers to grade. It's just really hard. I'm really stressed out. And he goes, you're clearly in a time of need right now. <laughs> so I have planned for you what I think will be a spiritually transformative pilgrimage. <laughs> and although I'm like pretty cynical at this point in my life, there's this, there's this like real young pre-Columbia graduate student who's like, oh, spiritual transformation? <laughs> so not knowing where David is going to take me, uh, we get on the subway, we take a ferry across the Hudson, we find ourselves in New Jersey, David's girlfriend's sister picks us up, and off we go plunging through the streets of New Jersey. After about 20 minutes, we hit the suburbs, and then, sort of booming in the horizon, I think, that I see our destination. It is big. It is concrete. It is windowless. The scales fall from my eyes, and I turn to David, and I say, did you just take me to a pilgrimage to a mall? <laughs> and he goes, I mean, you're gay and I need pants. <laughs> so I go shopping with him. Um, we get him some pants. It was no pilgrimage. <laughs> I felt no spiritual transformation. And then we begin our journey home, and I am a bit ornery and annoyed and disappointed. And on the train going back to the Upper West Side, I'm sitting next to David. The train is about 70 people, it's a fairly full train. And um, the doors open, and this man, who's about my age, 28, gets on the train, and he has bloodshot eyes, and a torn shirt, torn pants. And he begins to scream well above the din of these 17, 70 train passengers. The world is meaningless! And I'm like, what? <laughs> and then he proceeds for two and a half minutes to give this kind of oddly brilliant, epic poem rap, <laughs> which culminates in the apocalypse. But <laughs> to get there, he, in very graphic and horrifying detail, described what humans are capable of doing to each other, the violence to each other and to each other's bodies. And he stopped, 
And really, I think for the first time and only time in my life, a New York City subway car went silent. And um, everyone is just kind of nervously, uncomfortably shifting in their seats. No one's making eye contact. Everyone is, you know, like disturbed. And um, I do not know what possesses me. But I rise. And I want to say I like walked over to him. But I would say probably more like awkwardly, haltingly, like, I don't know. I wish tentative was a, tentative towards him. And um, everyone is just watching this happening. And um, I, get, I get to the guy, and I go, hey. And he goes, what? <laughs> and then I go, like really, so, so, so awkwardly, I go, I don't know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know, man. Um, uh, I feel like, um, I feel like you're like a, I feel like you're like a master of language, like, I mean, your, your rhythms and your, your meter was like really unexpected and, I don't know, complicated and just re super, super interesting. And your rhymes were like, I don't know, unconventional. And um, I don't know, I just feel like you're a, like a master of your craft. And um, he goes, What? <laughs> um, and then, like, this is really the kicker. I don't, I really don't know where this comes from. I go, can I sing a song to you? And he's like, okay. And the entire train is for sure watching. Um, and I, <laughs> I shut my eyes um, and I, I don't not enter into a trance-like state. <laughs> And in like the most minor, deconstructed way, I go, again, in the middle of the train, 70 people watching in front of this guy who just did a two and a half minute long epic poem about the apocalypse. And for sure, the train was like, what <laughs> the fuck? <laughs> but this guy goes, 
is that Hebrew? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And he goes, what does it mean? Where did that come from? I'm like, 18th century Ukraine rabbi mystic, Nachman of Bretzlov, means this world is a very narrow bridge. The main thing is we can't be afraid. And he goes, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a minister. And I go, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a rabbi. And he goes, brother. And I go, brother. <laughs> and the train stops, and David, like, grabs me by the arm. <laughs> and sort of shunts me off the train. And he goes, Jordan, That was crazy behavior, Jordan. <laughs> and I'm like, David, I know, I know. I'm in a place of need. Like you said, I'm in a state of need. I'm in a state of need. And he goes, I know, I know, Jordan, I know. Um, one thing I will say, though, is that even if you can't figure out how to write a response to nihilism, you just for sure lived a response. Um, I did not write the paper, uh, but uh, three years later, I did find myself sitting in Sharon's class. And although you sang no Rabbi Nachman songs, it felt to me like somehow you were able to look each person in that class in the eye and say to us without language, it's true. The world is a very narrow place. The main thing is to not be afraid but what you were adding to Rabbi Nachman's teaching was, the main thing is not to be afraid because we are in this together. And when I got that message, I knew I had found my teacher. <laughs>